Hello, and welcome to this episode of The Security Angle. I'm your host, Shelley Kramer, Managing Director and Principal Analyst here at The Cube Research. And today I am joined by my co-host and fellow analyst, Joe Peterson. Hello, Joe. It's great to see you. Hello, Ms. Shelley. So today we're going to have a conversation about zero trust and why adopting a zero trust secure to security is table stakes today. So before we dive in, I want to start with a little bit of backstory. The term zero trust was coined about 14 years ago by a guy named John Kindervag, a security analyst at Forrester Research. And Kindervag proposed a security model based on the principle of never trust, always verify, meaning that no user or device should be trusted to access a resource without continuous verification of their identity and authorization, regardless of whether they're inside or outside the network perimeter. Makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Along those lines, a zero trust approach is a cybersecurity strategy where no user device or application is inherently trusted, regardless of its location on the network, and every access attempt must be verified and authorized before access is granted, and essentially operating on the pr principle of never trust, always verify, and this is all to minimize security risks. So a zero trust cybersecurity strategy shifts away from the traditional perimeter-based security models that um, that trust devices inside the network by default, and, and this instead requires continuous authentication and authorization for every access request. So there are about five key points when you think about adopting a zero trust approach, and these include things like there should be no implicit trust. You're going to see us talk a lot about trust today. Um, there should be no implicit trust. And so unlike traditional security, zero trust assumes that any user device or application could be compromised. So no entity is automatically trusted just because it happens to be on the internal network. Pretty smart. Uh, there is strict identity verification and Every access attempt requires strong authentication and authorization, including verifying user identity, the device health, and application permissions. Another factor here is least privilege access. And in this instance, users are only granted the minimal level of access that they need to perform the tasks that they need to do. And this, of course, prevents unnecessary exposure to sensitive data. Continuous monitoring is also involved as systems are constantly monitored for suspicious activity and access can be revoked immediately if a potential threat is detected. And last but not least, having a data-centric security approach means that um, you're protecting sensitive data itself, not just the network perimeter, by applying granular access controls based on classifications of different data. So there you have it, just kind of an overview of the key principles of zero trust. And, you know, there are lots of benefits here, Joe. There are. And, you know, we want to keep everyone in the straight and narrow here and say that this is a bit of a journey that you're going to take if you decide to put this in place. Yeah. But there's, it, it just is. It's going to be work for you and your team. And zero trust is not a product. It's a framework. Yeah. Right? So there are benefits, um, and here's a few of the ones that stand out for me. First of all, you're going to get enhanced security. Um, you're by adopting a zero trust approach, you're going to reduce the attack surface because you're going to prevent unauthorized access to sensitive data and systems. So that's a win for every team, right? You're going to have improved visibility because a zero trust approach provides better monitoring and detection of potential threats across the network. A zero trust, you got to think about VPN, for example. VPN was something that served us in the time of the early internet. Yep. But it was it was a, you know, moat and fortress mentality. And it assumed that everybody was going to come back into an HQ location. And not every and work has changed. Yeah. Post pandemic most of us work remote at least part of the time. So zero trust is able to adapt to more modern work environments. It doesn't matter if you're on the road. It doesn't matter if you're working from your home office. Yeah. It's going to know it's you. Yeah. And um, that's a big deal. 
Well, and I think the other thing, you know, I like your analogy about the the castle and the moat, because I think that there was a time when we thought that, you know, we're here inside the moat, so we're safe, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what we know now not to be true, that right. just because you happen to be inside the castle, inside the moat, doesn't mean you're safe. Yeah, so true. And, you know, zero trust allows you more granularity. It's going to tell you things that a VPN would never tell you. For example, like a VPN is going to know your device, but it doesn't know that it's you, right? right. A VPN is never going to know that you're not supposed to be working in Spain. So why are you coming in from Spain, right? You're a U.S. based employee or Portugal or wherever, you know, else in the world that you're supposed to be. Um, but there's some challenges. And it's more complex and you have to have a plan. That's right. what I'd say to folks. You, you just, you can't just go at it willy nilly. You got to have a plan. You got to have a way to think through how you're going to manage these multiple technologies, manage authentication, manage authorization, manage monitoring. And it's a cultural shift. Yeah. It assumes that you're going to have this level of education with your employees and you're going to help them change their mindset. And it's not always the cheapest. I've seen go note go decisions um, on some of these products that were are within that provide zero trust services because they're just frankly more expensive than dealing rolling out that old VPN. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. um, Shelley, give us some advice on how to get started. Well, I think that you know, I think that. Just going back to the comment that you made earlier, you know, this is a little bit like a digital transformation journey in the sense that you don't just get up one day and go, I want to uh, uh, digital, let's do digital transformation yeah. and get out the, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, a, it's a process. It's a journey. It requires an architecture. It requires a strategy. It requires continuous monitoring and evolution, right? So it is it is much like a digital transformation journey. I think getting started with zero trust, it's important to understand that this is an evolutionary process and mm -hmm. one that once you decide this is how we are going to embrace security within our organization, you have to understand that it is a process. You don't just buy it, you know, just flip yeah. a switch. We're on right. zero trust now. So anyway, I think that, I think that, you know, so you want to keep that in mind. And when you're thinking about getting started, you know, with zero trust, um, I think one of the things that I always point people to is I love the Cloud Security Alliance's zero mm -hmm. trust roadmap um, to zero trust architecture. And, you know, they advise that a full fledged zero trust program can take anywhere from two to three years to fully develop. Oh. So you've got to go in knowing that this is a journey. And, um, and the process includes everything from evaluating tools and technologies and then deciding what you want to use and then integrating and adjusting them and, you know, all of those sorts of things. Um, you know, another resource is Cloudflare launched a couple of years ago, a detailed architecture and a roadmap to zero trust. Mm -hmm. About that same time, security experts and practitioners also established with, you know, the reference architecture to provide a, a vendor agnostic zero trust architecture, which is called ZTA, along with a kind of an implement example implementation timeline. And, and so, you know, this roadmap to zero trust assumes that an organization is at the beginning stages of this journey. Mm -hmm. And there are four stages, that four phases that are involved in an implementation timeline. And these cover things like deploying global DNS filtering and establishing corporate identity and creating an inventory of your corporate apps. And then of course, enforcing multi-factor authentication. Um, so I think that, you know, to me, when you look at this and you think about, you know, the whole, we, we talked about this multiple times, but the basic premise behind the zero trust journey is getting to never trust, always verify. And, you know, when we look at that zero trust journey, it's always about getting there. And this is comprised of four phases, and it's similar to any other strategic undertaking that you embark upon. And, and this includes uh, preparing, planning, assessing, and implementing. And so when I looked at 
only, and I'm not trying to scare anybody away, but there, this is, you said this too earlier, it's, it's complex. It takes time. And so if we look at just the prepare phase alone, the steps involved there include, you have to start by developing a strategy. I mean, that's really kind of how you start anything, right? But you have to start by developing a strategy. Your road to zero trust strategy is going to include setting plans and actions and goals to help achieve that vision for zero trust implementation within your organization. Um, you need to develop a comprehensive organizational plan that it, that identifies how your zero trust investments will achieve business and operational executive uh, business and operational objectives. And of course, that is also what you need to defend the budget allocation that you mm -hmm. need to ask for, right? And then you need to evaluate your infrastructure and. It's not at all unusual for organizations to struggle documenting the existing systems, architectures, and assets they have, whether those are in the cloud, on-prem, or in a hybrid environment. But you have to evaluate your infrastructure, and you have to know the foundation upon which you're building this zero-trust architecture. So you've got to lay the groundwork. You've got to do that, that assessment, the audit. You've got to you've got to develop a strategy. And then, you know, in the past, I think that, you know, some organizations have performed periodic asset assessments, but the shift toward continuous monitoring requires a, a dynamic approach to cyber threats. Mm -hmm. And, and so again, to your point that, you know, it takes money, it's complex. It also takes time. So you really need to consider things like, you know, maybe you want to partition areas of the enterprise or your system and divide the zero trust effort into, break it up into, so it's in more manageable parts. So we can just focus right over here for now, and then we can move to integrating here. Um, so you have to, I think, do it in bite-sized chunks. Um, you also nodded to the fact that this can be expensive. And so you need to establish a budget and, you know, you, you don't just, you don't just buy hardware. You don't just buy cloud services. You have mm -hmm. to set a budget. It has to be able to support these operational and technical and the HR aspects of the zero trust transformation. And again, we don't tell you all these things to scare you off, but we just tr are trying to educate you that this is actually a journey. And then, and then you need to build a roadmap and the roadmap here, this is your strategy. It's a visualization of the resources that you have and the activities and the dependencies required to execute the zero trust strategy. And this involves all aspects of the organization. So using this roadmap to initiate conversation throughout the organization about the impacts and the trade-offs in, in workflows and other sorts of things, that all of these are an important element of this phase. So as you can see, there's a lot involved here as it relates to embarking upon a zero trust journey. But today, I'm going to go back to where we started. And I will tell you that in, in my world, and based on what I see and what I'm talking with clients about, zero trust is largely viewed as kind of table stakes today. So if you're not there yet, I think it really would make sense to, to think about getting started because this is, I think this is not only the future, but this is the now of cybersecurity. Right, it is. And you've got some regulatory things that are happening right now that are sort of pushing the envelope. And what I mean by that is the CMMC um, timeline just tightened a bit, yeah. Yeah. right? And that just rolled out and companies that deal with the government only have a limited amount of time to shore things up if they want to continue to do work with the government. And right. zero trust is part of that whole CMMC journey. Um, you know, and but back to something you said, zero trust is not just solely a technical solution. It's yeah. really a sort of this collection of processes that are built on top of IT, such as asset management, identity management, authentication, but you need to start somewhere, right? Where, where do you start? How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? <laughs> and, and one thing that I think about is thing I was alluding to earlier. It's that network segmentation piece. Yeah. And you said it too, it's that sort of act of partitioning things into maybe manageable tasks and jobs that you can do. So network segmentation is, is one of the ways to start getting there. And it means partitioning your network into smaller networks to restrict access levels and to isolate hosts and services that contain sensitive data. You don't want Johnny from sales coming into accounting, right? So you, you, you want to do what's called micro segmentation or network segmentation. Yeah. Um, and that's a good way to sort of start the, that ball rolling. 
Um, it's really not unusual for me to see companies begin with zero trust network access, also called ZTNA, as one of that, the first actionable steps in their journey. Right. And in case you haven't, you're not familiar with it, it's a security service that allows remote users, like we were sort of talking about earlier in the VPN model, to securely access an organization's applications, data, and services. It's going to verify the user and grant access to specific applications based upon their identity and contextual policies that are put in, in place. And what's cool about it is it operates on this really adaptive trust model where trust is never implicit yeah. and access is granted on a need to know basis, right? And we, we sort of talked about that difference between VPNs and ZTNA. ZTNA grants access only to specific services or applications. You yeah. can't just get into the whole castle. You just can't, right? And that's that's the way a VPN is built. Yeah. Unless you do some fancy stuff, which you could, but it's just generally not built that way. And the benefits of ZTNA are pretty cool. It eliminates gaps in other secure remote access technologies and methods. It also removes application assets from public visibility. That's a big deal. And it significantly reduces the attack surface. If the bad guys can't see it, they have a harder time getting to it. Right. right. Um, ZTNA is based on principles such as continuous verification, limiting the blast radius, and minimizing impact if an external or insider breach occurs. So what I mean by that is lateral movement. Y'all may have seen my crazy cat video where I show lateral movement for a cat. <laughs> <laughs> but what it's trying to do is it's trying to block what's known as east-west traffic. That's the ability for a user to get from this part of the network to another part of the network. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's kind of cool. And it uses something called software-defined perimeter. Can you tell us a little bit about that, Shelley? The software-defined perimeter. Well, many roads lead to ZTNA, and each architecture has its own strengths and weaknesses and trade-offs. We know this, right? And, and so software-defined perimeter, or SDP, is is one of the most common architectures, I think. And this is an appliance and proxy-based architecture, a reverse proxy appliance. The SDP connector is deployed at the network edge and is governed by a centralized policy-based controller. And this tech is based on single packet authorization. And it's often agentless for the client, uh, which is the initiating host. And it may not require a separate SDP connector appliance if the SDP connector software is deployed directly to the target system or systems. And that said, that's kind of a mouthful, but there are about 45 vendors in the SDP category. And we're going to talk about just a few of them. You know, and before, before I do that, I want to say every time we talk about this, I'm always reminded of um, Zscaler CEO, Jay Chowdhury, um, did a keynote or maybe he did an interview with the Cube sometime in the last year or two. And he, and he talks about zero trust. And, and one of the examples that he gives, I think, you know, your castle and moat example is, is such a great analogy. Um, but one of the things that Jay said, it's kind of like, you know, when you walk and something that most of us have experienced, right? So you're walking into an, uh, an enterprise's uh, place of business. So you go in and what do you have to do? You have to check in, you have to give them your ID, mm -hmm. you have to, you know, sign in, all of that sort of thing. And in some instances you do that and then they just open the gate and they say, go, mm -hmm. go anywhere you want. And that is kind of how a VPN works. Mm -hmm. You're in, right? Well, how Zero Trust works is more like I arrive, I sign in, you come and get me and you take me exactly to the one place that I'm supposed to be within that organization. And that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about this kind of access and we're talking about really limiting, um, you know, how somebody can roam within an organization. So, or, or even a threat actor can roam within an organization. So it, it always pops in my mind when we're talking about this, because I thought that was just such a, that was an example that most of us can relate to because yeah. we've done it at some time or another. So anyway, back to SDP vendors. Um, 
Twingate ZTNA. Twingate is a provider of remote access solutions. They focus on enabling distributed workforces to securely access corporate resources, right? We need, we all need this with our, distrib- with our distributed workforce. That is our reality, right? So we're able to do this without compromising productivity. So Twingate's uh, solution is a cloud-based ZTNA solution. It allows IT and security teams to implement a software-defined perimeter and centrally manage users and device access to corporate applications without using any external hardware or changing their existing infrastructure. So that's kind of cool. Um, Once users have installed the Twingate app and signed in, Twingate ZTNA connects them to applications on the corporate network through the app's FQDN or IP address with no interaction from the user. And this helps to minimize friction in the access process and something that, you know, you may not think about as a user, but basically it speeds the time to you getting to do what it is you want to do, right? So the platform supports split tunneling which ensures quick and strong connections and the the IPR technology automatically makes authorization and rounding decisions and it reduces alerts for IT teams, which is a big yay. Um, From the management console, admins can configure user access policies at an app level and this helps stop that lateral spread of attacks that you nodded to a moment ago. Um, These policies are based on the context of each access attempt and it takes into account attributes like device posture, location, and time. And admins can also gain insights um, into network access activity and provision and deprovision users. And they can configure integrations and identify providers such as Okta and One Login to enable single sign on for all users. Um, Twingate CTNA's cloud based software only solution, which means it gives you flexibility to integrate easily. It also is scalable and how, and you can use it to support small teams, larger businesses, whatever, anything in between. Um, some of the customer feed customer feedback about the Twingate CTNA platform is that the interface is intuitive. Uh, the connection is reliable. The ease of deployment is great. Um, and so to make deployment and ongoing management even simpler, I think it's really cool that Twingate offers a ton of different support options. They have priority support for businesses by way of an enterprise subscription. Um, and, you know, really bottom line, Twingate ZTNA is a strong solution for small to mid-sized businesses looking to provide secure access to their remote users. It's user-friendly for end users and admins alike. There is no reason not to check it out. Another one that's on my radar screen is NordLayer. Uh, NordLayer is from Nord Security, and they specialize in user-friendly security for businesses. NordLayer is the company Zero Trust Network Access Solution. It serves as a modern alternative to the traditional VPNs that we were just talking about. NordLayer enables users to connect seamlessly to their corporate networks, and it uses the platform's NordLinks protocol um, for a swift remote connection. Again, this is checking all the boxes that people want, right? Easy, fast, not complex. Um, and the platform then fortifies each connection through user authentication, network segmentation, and traffic encryption. It's designed for seamless integration with cloud or multi-cloud systems. It's delivered as a service and that facilitates central and remote management by IT administrators, which is pretty attractive. Um, I think that one of the distinct feature sets of NordLayer is that it emphasizes secure access and connection. So by adhering to the principles of zero trust and least privilege, the platform ensures that users only reach the applications and the data that they need to do their jobs. And the cloud firewall that's supplied by NordLayer offers um, stable network, network traffic inspection, packet inspection, integrate intrusion prevention, and cloud-based threat intelligence. So these features all work together to ensure a robust defense against network security threats. And um, you know, one other thing worth mentioning is that I think NordLayer's device posture, posture security module allows for continuous monitoring of all network connected devices, which is exactly what you need today. Um, this enables administrators to set policies, alerts, and and it prevents non-compliant devices from accessing the network. Um, for additional protection, NordLayer has uh, user authentication through integrations with multiple third-party MFA and SSO providers, including Azure AD, Google Workspace, Okta, and OneLogin. 
all traffic undergoes AES 256-bit encryption, and the kill switch feature ensures that if a server connection breaks, all device traffic is halted, and that minimizes the potential you know, security threats. From a management perspective, IT and security admins can oversee user accounts. They can designate permissions. They can configure security policies through a, a unified management console, which I really like a lot. Um, the fact that it's cloud-based means that Nord Layer is straightforward to deploy. It's effortlessly, effortlessly scalable, which I think is incredibly attractive. Um, the platform support structure includes live chat and email, and the company makes a commitment to address queries within a three-hour window. And also provides support from a dedicated account manager. Um, NordLayer is another one that's a strong ZTNA solution for organizations really of any size who are looking for user-friendly, intuitive um, ways to secure remote access to company resources. So that's another one to check out. Yeah, and I, I, you know, think that this is particularly attractive for a smaller company that doesn't have a deep engineering yeah. bench because yeah. of the ability to install it quickly and easily. Yeah. Well, right? and the support too. You know, the support think... is a big deal. Yeah. Right. The support is a big deal because if you don't have a deep bench, it's tough to fix things. And the and the reality of it is, Joe, most people don't have a deep bench today. You yeah. Know? So that's why these solutions, I think, are so valuable. Yep. Well, I'm going to talk about our friends at Akamai. If you've right. been in IT for a hundred years, like I have, <laughs> I'm not going to say you have. I'm going to say. Um, I think I'm older than you are, but all right then. Fun. Akamai is known as the de facto CDN provider in the world. I mean. Just it is, yeah. right? They have competitors. But what I like is that they've really taken their technology chops and morphed themselves into a cybersecurity company. Yeah. And they're doing tons more than CDN today. And in case you weren't aware of that, Akamai's enterprise application access, which I have a customer using, mm -hmm. is Akamai's ZTNA product. And they're a very, very big customer. This is a very... Um, intuitive and intelligent platform. And so it's delivered via cloud. There's no virtual or physical hardware to manage or maintain. Um, this client is literally in multiple countries in the world, right? And the solution runs on the distributed infrastructure of Akamai's intelligent edge platform. And right. what that does with these global companies, it allows them to have remote workers access the the company's network securely, yeah. which is a big deal. Um, with enterprise application access, admins can configure per application access policies based upon roles and privilege. So it's really granular. Right, like that. That'll help. Yeah, right. It'll help minimize the spread of account takeover and mail malware attacks through the network. Um, they can manage all policies via this single portal. And it makes it easier to access across AWS, Azure, Google Cloud apps, as well as web and SaaS applications. Enterprise application access analyzes signals in real time, such as user identity, device posture, endpoint compromise. It'll do things like detect an anomalous activity. It'll block high risk access, right? So the guy that's based in the US that all of a sudden is coming in from Spain. Yeah. Why has that happened? And it knows it's happening. And it will send a note to the user and the admin. Hey, is this you? It's kind, kind of, of cool. like your credit card, right? Hey, <laughs> I mean, it's you just yeah. use your credit card, right? Yeah. Um, it built, it offers built in MFA and SSO. So if you're somewhere where that's not working for you, this will work for you because yeah. that happens when you're traveling, right? Right. Um, it's scalable. It'll integrate with LDAP and Edact directory. It'll also integrate with SEM and SEM logs uh, by a unified log streamer. So now you've got this correlation effect that's going on, which is a big deal because the, the endpoint logs are feeding into the SEM. This is feeding in, right? And everything, all the data is getting correlated. Right. Um, so kind of interesting. The next one, we talked about them earlier, but they have done an amazing job. Uh, in the security space, and it's Cloudflare. Yeah. And the product is called Access. 
And it's meant to augment or replace traditional VPN solutions, right? It's just how it's built. Um, and Access is their ZTNA solution. Right. And it's also really granular role-based access. So if you're if you're worried about a highly distributed workforce um, and you don't want everybody getting into finance, you don't have to have everybody getting into finance, right? It's, it's just not going to happen. Cloudflare also offers strong integrations with multiple identity providers. Um, and that makes it easier to integrate into your systems and get going with something. And we were talking about that earlier. How do right. I just get going, right? Yeah. How do I get going on this path? This is a great way to do it. Um, Cloudflare will verify device before creating access. It'll analyze the health posture indicators, such as serial number and MTLS certificates to ensure that it is that device and it's your device that's coming in. Um, it's got a globally, like Akamai, they've got this globally distributed edge network, which makes it easier to do some of this authentication work because it is such a global network. Yeah. So, um, and it's made for pretty much any size organization. So kind of cool stuff. Yeah, I like that. Well, and they, and I think some of the integrations with endpoint protection providers is also cool. You mm -hmm. know, I think they integrate with CrowdStrike and Sentinel One. And so I think that's pretty attractive. It is. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, very cool stuff. So wrapping up, here are some key takeaways on both Zero Trust and ZTNA. As I mentioned earlier, Zero Trust philosophy can really be summarized and, and boiled down to just one phrase. What is that, Joe? Never trust. Always verify. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so ZTNA falls within the identity and access management component of Zero Trust and deals with user access to an organization's application. The ZTNA model is a mix of the principle of least privilege, privilege software-defined perimeters, and advanced security tools and perimeters. The two main ZTNA architectures are endpoint-initiated using an agent on each user device and service-initiated using cloud. Um, and before jumping into ZTNA, your organization should consider whether it can support a standalone ZTNA solution or whether it should invest in a third party ZTNA as a service provider. And sometimes that's, you know, that latter choice is not a bad path to go. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, along with that, you also get considerable amount of support, which is always attractive to me. Um, with that, this will wrap our conversation about why adopting a zero trust approach to security is what we regard, what we nerds regard as table stakes today and thoughts on how to get started with that zero trust journey. And I think the one thing that we both agree, well, we agree on most things, but what we want to leave you with is, you know, we've talked about the fact that it can be complex. We've talked about the fact that it can be a little expensive. And we've talked about the fact that it's a journey um, that, you know, and even getting started, you can plan on taking two to three years, but don't let any of that scare you away because this really is, I think, you know, I mentioned this before, it's not only the future, it's the now when it comes to really protecting your organization. So I hope that we've given you some good food for thought and some good, you know, points on, you know, where to, where to look when you're thinking about getting started and why to get started. So with that, I'm your host, Shelly Kramer, Managing Director and Principal Analyst here at the Cube Research. And thanks to my co-host, Joe Peterson, for joining me. Always a pleasure. And thanks to our viewing and listening audience for tuning into the Cube, which is your source for enterprise and emerging tech news. And we'll see you here next time.